my brain back to, to the room. Anyways, hey, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 22, and what we're studying is all things new, and we're actually on study four of all things new, and we're going to go into all things new, the fifth study, because we're looking at the very end of the story. We're looking at Revelation uh, chapter 22, and we are not finishing, even though it's been my desire to finish, and uh, we haven't, we haven't done, done that yet, but anyways, Revelation chapter 22, let's go ahead and pray, and we can get into the teaching. Dear God, as we enter into this time of looking into incredible promises, incredible truths about you, Lord, may it be that you encourage and minister to our hearts during such a time as this, God. The world has gone crazy, but your promises are still true about the church. And may it be that your church stands strong, that the gates of hell would not prevail, meaning that we are not barricading ourselves in the comfort of the sanctuary, but they, we are out there bringing down strongholds and making a difference in this world, again, for such a time as this. We love you, Lord. We praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. For such a time as this, we used to have it painted on the back wall, and uh, if you're inclined to come out on Wednesday nights, we're actually in the book of Esther, where that term comes from, for such a time as this, and I really believe that is so true for the church today, for such a time as this. Quick note, um, where we are as a nation, uh, I am a pastor, which means shepherd, and so I'm supposed to bring some of the things that are happening in society into a proper perspective for the Bible, okay, with the Bible. And, uh, you know, right now with the election and everything, uh, where my stance is personally, and I think this is important for us as a nation, is number one, pray for two of my friends, uh, Jack Hibbs and Rob McCoy. And if you don't know about them, they've gotten on the national stage. And I, I believe God has called them to stand up and to, to speak. Now, I know both of them a little bit. Uh, Rob McCoy, uh, his assistant pastor, is one of my good friends, and I worked with him over the years. But uh, Rob McCoy has just been out there just speaking and, and, and challenging uh, our nation in a radical way. Now, we've done that in the past. Uh, we've stood up, and we've been counted, and, and uh, we've been attacked. God isn't calling me to be a loud voice right now, so you guys can settle down. It's okay. I'm not going to throw myself you know, out there and be Harry Carey and show, be on the front page of the newspaper uh, anytime soon, I think. I kind of hope. I don't like doing that, but if God tells us to do that. But right now, the Lord is just you know, giving me a peace and a comfort that you know, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, right? And the church is going to make it. The church is going to be fine. We might struggle, but in that struggle, as we hold on to the Lord, we're stronger in the end, guys, regardless of what happens. The true church stands and becomes stronger amidst persecution and trial. Now, to, to bring things back to current events and kind of my view of current events, um, in 2000, we had this election that was challenged, and it went 37 days before we figured out about the hanging chad there in Florida, right? Right? And it went down to a bunch of court cases and everything else. And then afterwards, it was litigated and everything else. And people had a relative piece about, okay, the right person won. Um, the thing is, in this election, the problem is we've had such unprecedented ways to vote this time around, right? So mail-in ballots, not absentee ballots, but mail-in ballots where governors were sending mail-in ballots that could be official to everybody in their whole state, like 30 million people plus in California, right? And, and so all of a sudden, election uh, fraud can take place. The legislatures didn't make that rule. It was the governors, which can't make rules. Governors just fulfill rules, right? They're executives. Uh, they're like the police. They're not the legislators making laws, you know? So you have all these questions across the board, um, all kinds of potential for fraud, and now we're voting electronically, and we got hackers, and we have all kinds of craziness. And the thing is, guys, I don't know who's going to win the election uh, as far as president goes, and I don't know, but, but the thing is, I want to be confident that the person that the American people voted for actually becomes president. So I think that's important, especially moving forward, because every election could potentially be like this from this time forward. So at this point in time, I'm okay with waiting. 
And in fact, during that week of, of, of prayer and fasting, my wife goes, who, who do you think is going to win on Tuesday? I said, nobody. <laughs> I knew this was coming, and I think the Lord laid it upon my heart, but I'm just going, this is a mess. This is already a mess. We're, we're going to have no idea who our president is um, with all this. But I do think it's important just to be patient, to keep on praying that the process is purified and cleansed. Understand, one of the cleanest states for the election was Florida this year. Why? Because Florida was so embarrassed about how bad it was in the year 2000, right? And, and so, you know, with, with, with how, you know, gloves off, fist fight, uh, separated and divided our government has been of late between uh, basically two different sides, I think anything's possible. So what do we need to do? We need to be patient. We need to pray. Listen, Christians don't make choices out of fear. I'm not afraid. It, you know, we, we make choices out of wisdom, and I think wisdom would say pray for, for the integrity of the elections in our country, because if we're unsure about this one, the next one's just going to be worse, right? You know, so that's where I'm at, you know, and so I'm, I'm waiting, and I'm praying, and I hope everything gets investigated and that we get our act together so we don't have any more of this foolishness. But please don't be the wide-eyed, crazy Christian out there with all kinds of wild accusations. Promote Christ more than you promote your political affiliation. Please, one's eternal, one's just temporary. You know, and the church in prosperity doesn't tend to do as good as the church in persecution. Just, just to say, <laughs> you know, we become stronger. And so whatever way it goes, you know, use the prosperity if we keep on going uh, and, and the church continues to have freedom. Um, don't take advantage of that freedom, or take it for granted, excuse me, take advantage of it, but don't take it for granted. And if we come under persecution, man, we're all going to grow stronger in the Lord. If you're a true believer, you're going to grow stronger in the Lord. That's what happens, right? We're like the starfish. They try to cut us up, and what do we do? We multiply, you know, and this is what the true church does. And so I just want to encourage you guys with that. Keep on praying, and, uh, and uh, don't let your heart be troubled. God is still on the throne, last I heard, you know, and the eternity is what we're looking at here. So let's look to the future, to the good stuff, okay? So we're in Revelation chapter 22. We're going to start our teaching at verse 6, but um, I'm going to go ahead and start reading at verse 1. And it reads this, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, every tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever." In verse 6, and he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Now of note, it says here, the Lord God of the holy prophets. This is an interesting title for God. And as far as I can tell, it seems to be the only place where he's entitled this, the Lord God of the holy prophets. What does this mean? It means that much of the scriptures and well, all of the scripture is given by revelation. And prophecy is merely God's thought or mind or heart or intent or words given to man. That's the most general view of prophecy. And so the whole word of God, even if it is a narrative and writing down history like the book of Acts or like the book of Genesis, is really ultimately prophecy or revelation, God inspiring man to properly record whether it be a prophecy or whether it be history. And so God communicated his word or his truth through human vessels. And a lot of people say, well, man wrote it. Yeah, isn't that amazing? that God used up to 44 different authors over 1,500 years to write this progressive revelation of God up to the cross and then to write a cohesive looking back to the cross in the New Testament. And it's all cohesive. 66 different books by 44 different authors over 1,500 years. And it is absolutely cohesive and the most scrutinized piece of literature in all of history and has not been found false. That is just amazing. Amazing. 
right? And so this is the God who inspired everybody who wrote the Word of God, and this is the God who certainly inspired the, pro- uh, uh, the prophets. And so these words are faithful and true. Sometime in, in the late uh, 19th century, some of the major denominations in America uh, were having this battle. Is the Word of God authoritative, and is the Word of God inerrant? And many of those denominations let go of the inerrancy and the authority of God's word. And they started saying things like, it, it contains God's word, but it's really like not all God's word. What happens when you allow that in? Well, what happens immediately is we can now decide what is truly God's word and what really isn't God's word. And so instead of the word of God cutting us to the bones and marrow and really getting into our lives and changing us and preparing us for all of eternity, now we're judging the word of God. And that gets scary. Because now we can tell God what he thinks about us as opposed to learning what God, uh, or what we think about him, as opposed to allowing him to tell us what he thinks about us. And you need to know that it, much, it matters much more greatly what God thinks about us than what we think about him, <laughs> right? Because he is the eternal one, the essential one, the sustainer of all things, and the, things and, and, and the one for which all things were created. For his good pleasure, I exist. And, and, and what is God without me? Still God, right? What am I without God? Nothing, right? And, and so what God said matters. And what ended up happening is churches became liberal. And I don't know if you guys know this. I mean, the Southern Baptist Convention is a pretty conservative, pretty strong denomination, But they were in a battle for their souls uh, uh, because of this doctrine sneaking into their church. And there were battles and fights in order to keep the Southern Baptist Convention biblical because they were about just to judge the Bible like many other denominations have done. But what does God think about his word? It's faithful and it's true. And whether you believe it or not, that's up to you, (laughs) right? But if you believe it, you need to follow it. And so he talks about God's holy prophets. Now, the prophets did a couple of different things. So often we, we think about the foretelling of the prophets, but the prophets also foretold, which means they tell you what's happening right now. And so very often a prophet would go to a king or an authority and say, you are in sin because this is what you're doing or would reveal the sin that's in someone's heart. Remember David and Nathan. Nathan was a prophet. And David talked about this man that, had, or he, Nathan talked about this man that had a bunch of sheep, but he stole the poor man's sheep, the only sheep he had. And David's like, let's get that man. And, and Nathan said, you are that man, right? He forth told what was happening in, in David's life, right? That's, that's forth telling. But foretelling is one that we're always interested in, right? That's God telling something ahead of time. And, and the scriptures are full of prophecies, right? In Amos 3, 7, it says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And so the Lord foretells many things, very specific things. Now understand, our problem with biblical prophecy isn't that we take it too seriously or take it too specific. The, the, the thing with biblical prophecy is so often we don't take it specific enough, right? Right? So the nation of Israel exists today, and that's amazing, because the nation of Israel didn't have a country for 1,900 years. Could you imagine, like, China coming in and blowing up America and taking everybody and spreading them all over the earth? You think 1,900 years later we could come back as America? We'd we'd never do that, right? It's never happened before, but the Bible prophesied that it would happen. And so people, before Israel coming back as a nation, would take all these prophecies that talked about this nation coming back together, and they say, well, that's not really Israel, that's the church. And then all of a sudden, Israel becomes a nation again after 1,900 years, and they're like, oh, wait a second here. The Bible was specifically true in that prophecy. And so that foretelling that this people that didn't have a nation, they didn't have to excuse it away, spiritualize it, you know, make it mystical or allegorize it. They could actually believe that the word of God meant what it says and says what it means. And so prophecy is very specific. 2,500 prophecies, at least in the scriptures. 2,500. 
You know how many of them have been specifically fulfilled? More than 2,000. More than 2,000. Isn't that amazing? So are you going to bet against that last fifth showing up? It's not a good bet, is it? But this is how specific the scriptures are. Just concerning one man, Jesus Christ. This man, Peter Stoner. He wrote, can you guys hear me back there? You got it? Peter Stoner wrote a book called Science Speaks, and it applies the science of probability to some of the prophecies of Jesus. Now understand, when you assign a, a probability to an event, that's your assumption, right? But even if he's over-assuming, you need to understand that this probability is still astronomical as we look at his conclusions, right? So he looks at just eight of the prophecies of Jesus and considers the probability of these being fulfilled by just one man in a certain time frame, okay? being born in Bethlehem. How many of you guys got to choose where you were going to be born? Anybody in here? Is Jesus here? No. <laughs> I don't know, but actually he, did, he was born in Bethlehem. Did he choose to do that as a baby? No. Preceded by a messenger. So before you're born, that you get someone to go ahead of time to tell people that you're going to be born. Anybody in here get to do that? Enters Jerusalem on a donkey. Yeah, maybe he could have fulfilled that on his own. Maybe, maybe. Betrayed by a friend. Sold for exactly 30 pieces of silver. Again, it was prophesied hundreds of years before Christ. They would be sold, not by 31, not by 28, but with the, the price of a slave, 30 pieces of silver that that betrayal money would be thrown into the temple and that money would be used to buy a potter's field in order to bury people, foreigners, who died in the land, a field of blood. After he's dead, did he manipulate that or what? That he would be silent before his accusers and crucified. It was prophesied that Jesus Christ would be crucified before crucifixion was even a form of death. Now, we read in, in the Old Testament in, in Esther that people were, were, were hanged. They, 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 they weren't hung on a cross. They were actually impaled on a stick. So this, this thing of hanging people on a cross was developed by the Romans after it was prophesied that Jesus would die on a cross. How do you do that? Huh, maybe you know more than you actually know within this world. Maybe you're God, right? So he prophesied all these things. So Stoner concludes the odds of any man that he might live down to the present time fulfilling all eight of these prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th. That's one with 17 zeros after it. Can any of you guys even conceive of that number? A million is how much? One with six zeros. A billion is one with nine zeros. A trillion, like a trillion, I guess it's, never tell our government what a Brazilian is. Just kidding. Uh. <laughs> he says this, to give us an example, we're Texans, we understand this. Suppose we take 10 to the 17th amount of silver dollars and we lay them on the state of Texas. Now, if you've ever driven through West Texas, this is what I always ask. Every time we drive through West Texas, I think, we have a population pro uh, problem. Where would everybody live? Because <laughs> no one lives out there, right? It's just miles and miles of, of no people, right? But if you take the state of Texas and you cover them with 10 to the 17th amount of silver dollars, the whole state of Texas would be covered with two feet of silver dollars. Now, the chance that one man in the shorter time frame, not the 2,000 years, but in the shorter time frame, would fulfill these prophecies is more than some guy wading into that Texas full of two feet of silver dollars and reaching down and picking up the one marked silver dollar. That's with eight prophecies. If you take 48 of the prophecies of Jesus the odds increase to 1 in 157, or 1 in 10 times 157. That's a 1 with 157 zeros after it. 
That's a little more, right? Okay, that's 48 prophecies. You take all 300, what do you think you got? You think you have God coming, fulfilling his plan exactly in the person of Jesus Christ. And this was prophesied. It wasn't like, oh, we came out of Bethlehem. Well, a lot of kids were, were born in, in Bethlehem. You know, he moved to Egypt. Well, maybe a couple moved to Egypt, and out of Egypt he came. That was a prophecy. He grew up in Nazareth. Well, that was also prophesied. Well, how does a little kid determine that? So just three of those, just where he was, that might have happened maybe, 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 maybe. You see what I'm saying? And it was prophesied specifically. You know what? Your Bible in your hand, even though it might have a few copy errors, it has not changed any translation. Like you might read the NIV based off certain uh, uh, scriptures. You might, you know, read the New King James or the King James based upon other um, transcripts or whatever. And you can argue this to death, but you know what? The Bible you have in your hand, whether it's, a, it's an NIV, a New American Standard, a King James, a New King James, it is radically accurate and authoritative. And it has never been found false in all of history, even though it's the most scrutinized piece of literature ever. You can count on the Word of God. Now, do, do people come along and translate it in really bizarre ways? Absolutely. But when you read it as a whole, and you get to know God and God's character as a whole, it's pretty simple to read through it and go, wow, this is heavy, or to get to a place and go, this doesn't make sense, and then ask someone in the know or study it yourself, and you go, oh, okay, now, now I see where it fits in. It makes sense to me now right? Because there's a whole lot of, oh, I can disprove the Bible. Yeah, give, them, give me five minutes with them, you know? Or if they, have, if they do mess with me, I'll go find an answer for them. You know, the Word of God is radically reliable and authoritative in the sense that it tells us how to live an incredible life, how to find purpose, and how to find eternity. And it tells us who why we even exist, and, and who he is that created us. It exposes the one being that has to be essential in the universe. Either we, cre we came from nothing, and what can nothing do? Nothing. nothing. Or someone created us, and that's the essential being. That's what it comes down to philosophically. I've never heard anybody beat that argument, right? Ever. So the word of God has been given to us. And I want you to think about it. You know, if you invest in a beautiful home in Corpus Christi, how big does a hurricane need to be to wipe it out? Right? One of the reasons we built 10 buildings when we built a building is because I just thought, it's just a temporary dwelling place. It's not the church. You are. This is just a place where we gather. It's a, play, it's a tool that we use. Right? But a hurricane can wipe out a house. Is your house eternal? What about your car? Especially if you live on the island, right? How much salt gets on your car? You'll be driving down the road, all of a sudden, you know, a good gust of wind, and your car just goes poof into a pile of rust, right? <laughs> you, know, you just never know. It's crazy. But what's eternal? The Word of God, it says, is eternal. So is it good to invest in the Word of God? This week, I, I met with a couple of young men, you know, and, and I, I challenged them to memorize Scripture with me. That's horrible, man. I'm, I'm like over twice their age, and they're going to memorize it easier, but I still need to invest in the Word of God, even as a pastor that studies it all the time. I need to invest in it even more than I do, because it's eternal. Forever, this thing exists. What else is eternal? Men's souls are made eternal. You guys realize that, right? We invest in men's souls, human beings as well. Your children are more important than your house. They very much are. That money you loaned to a friend that he wasn't able to pay back, that friend's more important than the money you loaned him. And so these things really need to minister into our lives. And so faithful and true from the Lord of all the prophets. And then in Revelation 22, excuse me, in Revelation 22, verse 7, it goes on to say, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. So he's been receiving this revelation from Revelation 1. We've been looking at it for almost a year now. 
And he's received these, and he's just absolutely blown away at the revelation that he's received. And he, and, and, and he falls down at the feet of this messenger, this angel, who showed him these things. Verse 9 goes on to say, Then he said to me, See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Now, he says it kind of fancy. It's translated, see that you do not do that. That's not really what he's saying. He's saying, don't stop. Watch out. No. He's freaking out. Like, don't dare worship me. Worship God. I'm a servant of God, just like you are a servant of God. Worship God. And understand, we're not to bow before anything other than God himself. We are to worship God. In the Ten Commandments, it's very clear. What does it say? You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Nothing else that you worship before me. Do not bow down to these gods. Exodus chapter 20. We see this throughout the scriptures. One of the notable places that most of us know, we had these three young men. Their Babylonian names were Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, right? And this statue was built. They were supposed to bow down to the statue. What did they refuse to do? Bow down to the statue. Why? The Ten Commandments, no other gods before me. Worship God alone. But you need to be careful. As we're even seeing today on the news, certain movements want you to bow down before them. Don't do that. And Christians have been making a stance, and they take a lot of heat for it. But you know what? I'm not bowing down to anything to worship it other than God. Okay? And, and, and that's where I stand, and I don't, you can't browbeat me or try to manipulate me into doing that. I, I, I mean, you could try to force me to do it, but I'm not going to do it of my own uh, uh, volition. I, I, I'm not going to bow down, because I worship God. And understand, there's a tension between government and the church all the time. And, and I don't know when this shift happened, but our government officials aren't officials. They're actually, they're, they're actually public servants right? They're elected to be public servants. And I've actually heard a judge say, someone called the, this, this, this judge by her name, and she goes, that's judge so-and-so to you. I'm like, whoa, whoa, Ooh, no, 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 that's public servant judge so-and-so. That's what I'll call you from now on. <laughs> and I like to remind officials, I pay your salary, you don't pay mine right? And, and this is true. But this is how our nation started. But by nature, as governments get larger and larger, they are vying for your allegiance. If I needed, if, if I was running a government and setting it up, there's no way that I would ever tax anybody for anything over 9% ever. Why? Because God should get 10%. <laughs> right? I mean, there's no way. Are you kidding me? But now we have some in our society, if they make a whole lot of money, can be just, you know, on, on top, just 40% can be taken away, plus all the property taxes and the sales tax and all the other taxes on everything else, up to 60% in, in a place like California. Some of the richest in California are, are, you know what, I'd much rather give my money than have it taken. I'm a pretty generous person. But I tell you what, if you abolish all taxes, are those who love big taxes going to pay voluntarily their money to the government? No, they want to force it out of you, right? So there's always this tension. You know, we have social programs through the government where money is forced out and it becomes 30% effective. 30% of the money goes where it's supposed to go. Or you have community organizations. I'm not talking about just churches. I'm talking about community organizations that help people in their community that they know with accountability. Those are 90% effective. When families do it, it's 100% effective. Why? More accountability, right? You know, so governments are always vying for this, and the government wants us to bow down to them. Let's revolt. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, anyways, I'll, I'll, sh I'll shut up. Hey, I just know it's not on the radio or the internet because they can't hear me, so I'm... <laughs> It's fair game today, right? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Worship God. 
worship God. And the interesting thing about worshiping God is when you worship Jesus Christ, you are worshiping God. Why? This angel freaks out and says, no, don't do it. But Jesus, when he was on the boat, when he walked out to them and, and calmed the waters, what did they do? Truly, you are the Son of God, which is an Old Testament title for the Messiah, for God in the flesh. You are the Son of God, which is an interesting term, right? You are the Son of God. I had a, I had a Jehovah's Witness come to me, to, to my door, and he said, well, look it, Jesus is God's Son. He isn't really God. And he had a son with him. I go, so is he less human than you are? And he goes, no. I go, so he's a chip off the old block, right? Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son which means he was the only human ever created with the DNA of the Holy Spirit and the DNA of, of, of Mary. He became God and man in the same person, his only begotten son. We're all creatures created by God, and we procreate, and we create other creatures, which have a sinful nature. But none of us are the only begotten son of God except for Jesus Christ himself, and he is a chip off the old block. He is God. Whoa, hey. Wow. Oh, now I can get in trouble, right? Because now, <laughs> now it's recorded. Anyways, are you passionate about God getting the credit? Are you passionate about God getting the credit? I run into people. You know, I ran into a young man that was raised in our church, but he's backslidden right now. I was talking to him, and, and the, you know, I'm kind of like distracted because I just like, you need to walk with God. And it's not because I'm mad at him. My, my heart is broken for him, right? My, my heart is, worshiping God puts you in the right place. It gives you the right perspective. It shows you who you are and what you need. You need to worship God. And it puts you in a place of, of, of the peace of fulfillment, or the, the, and the piece of, of purpose, and, and the piece of there's someone there who is God in my life, and this isn't all random and out of control, that I have God in my life, and he has promised me eternal life. You know, and, and, and you don't have that. Now, now, whether he is saved at the moment or not, I just know he's not living the fullest life, even though he's all slap happy and smile, because I live that life. I backslid in my life, and when I backslid in my life, I wasn't at peace with God, and I had no peace in my life. I don't know if the monitors are still on. I'm getting weird feedback up here. The monitors are the only thing working. Oh. Oh, so, so I can hear myself. You can't hear me. Okay. <laughs> so anyways, where's your passion lie? And now a lot of people say, well, pastor, that's your job. No, but it's your job too. Like, how does, how does the passion that you have for God flow out of you? You know, for me, it's, it's Bible teaching. That's what I do. Bible teaching and, and counseling, right? For you, it might be works of service. You might have the gift of helps, and, and you have all these other things, but it might be that's how you show it. You, you might be a prayer warrior, and your passion shows out because you pray for everybody and everything all the time. You might be evangelistic, and you just want to share. I mean, I know people that just can't help but share. You know, it's like, excuse me, uh, you know, will you reach that for me? Did you know Jesus loves you? Like that kind of person. I love these people, right? They're just amazing. You know, but how does your passion show in your life? And you have a way to do that. I mean, you might have the gift of giving to where you just, you know, give of your time, give of your person. You might give of your possessions. You know, you might be that with the gift of hospitality and you're, and you're that heartbeat of the church and you never let anybody that looks a little bit lonely go lonely. You know, you might have that gift of mercy and your passion for God shows in your mercy. You don't all have to be Pastor Rod. Please don't be. My wife would go crazy. <laughs> There's too many of me. You know, but I think the world would go nuts too. But listen, are you passionate about God? How does it show in your life? God made you uniquely you so that you could glorify God in your way. And if the whole church grasps, grasps that, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so he says, don't worship me. Verse 10, he goes on to say, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. Do not seal up the words of this prophecy. This prophecy, John was to write it down 
and he was to distribute it to the seven churches, and those churches would distribute it further. It was actually addressed to the church. And he says, the time is at hand. I want this generation or this, this time period in the timeline of God's plan, I want people to read this book and to understand it as much as possible. And so he says, the time is at hand. And we're reminded again that it's about to, to wrap up, right? The things which must shortly take place, verse 6, same chapter, I am coming quickly, the time is at hand, this verse, and I am coming quickly, right? I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming quickly. A lot of people say, well, where is he? Where is he? And I go, oh, you want to play that game? He's a day closer than he was yesterday. Where are you with him? Right? But again, if you just think about God, God is outside of time. Last week we had Bill Holdridge and he said, you know, God reached out and he probably created time first and he went, bink. And there's a spot of time out there in the endless universe. And then space and matter and everything else is created in this little dot. And God is all around it and inside of it, right? He's transcendent above all, right? And, and, and we think, God, you're not doing it fast enough. Well, because we're all impatient. And we all see things in a, in a very short time frame, right? If you were a Christian living during the Holocaust, you only had a short time frame, especially if you were in Germany or Poland, even in France, if you were being bombed in England. You had this, you know, this time frame and, and our perspective, but, but understand God's perspective is so far beyond ours. It says the Lord, uh, for the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day, right? And so he, he's all this, and then he created time in there. And so understand how big your God is. He is so patient. I've told you many times, if I was God, I would have blown us up a long time ago. <laughs> Boom! And then none of us would be saved, Right? Because mankind has been pretty evil for a long time, and he is extremely patient. Why is he patient? Well, Peter tells us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's patient because he cares about man, and he's not going to let man perish who would be saved. And so he keeps on waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. So I'm not going to complain against God's patience, right? I, I want him to come quickly. That's my heart. But at the same time, I have to trust him to be God and allow his time frame to work itself out. But as someone who studies the scriptures and, and, and looks at history, we're in a time where I do not see any other prophecies or any other events that have to take place before the Lord comes back for his church. I don't see anything else that has to take place. Possibly there's going to be a war or a battle between certain countries and Israel coming up. That may happen before the church is removed. It may happen after the church is removed. It's in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. But when I read it, it sure looks like it's nuclear warfare. And you start looking at the countries that are now aligned against Israel and hate Israel, and you look at their ancient names and you, you place them on their modern names. All those countries hate Israel today. It's interesting that a couple countries are making treaties with Israel and are friendly towards Israel, even though they're Muslim countries. And, and, and if you look at that list and you figure it all out, those countries are not included in the countries that actually attack Israel. Hmm, interesting. It's seemingly coming together. Part of that is Russia. You guys do realize that off the coast of Israel, they have found vast reserves of natural gas. And now they are running pipelines from those vast reserves of natural gas into Europe and supplying Europe with cheaper natural gas than who? Russia. And the southern states of Russia are actually involved in, in the old USSR, are actually involved in this battle to come against Israel. So not only is it a spiritual battle, there's money involved, <laughs> you know? And I'm just looking at it going, whoa, the time is at hand. It could be 50 years. It could be today. But I don't see anything that has to take place. Revelation speaks of a worldwide financial system. How many of you guys actually carry cash with you? I don't, you don't need to raise your hands, but we, we hardly do, right? It's like, what's this green stuff? <laughs> you know, we all have debit cards. I thought debit cards were crazy when they first came out. Are you kidding me? But now that's all I have. It's just so simple. It's just there. It's easy. 
right? And, and so all these things are coming. To, the ability to control the world through a political system. What has happened through COVID? We're watching it like up close and personal. It's happened. I'm just looking at it going, oh my gosh. And so this was revealed to us. Now, when these things are written from Daniel's perspective and Daniel 10, 11, and 12 are very interesting chapters as far as prophecy, you would look at that and you'd go, oh, how would this work out? But now we're looking at Daniel, which is supposed to be sealed for a while. Now at the times of the end, these things are being discovered. We're looking at Daniel going, oh, this makes absolute sense. And it's just amazing as you look at the scriptures. When is it going to happen? I think it's the season. I don't know the day or the hour, but he says, I come quickly. Now, also a way to interpret that is when it starts, it happens rapidly. So it's not always soon in order, but it's when it starts going down, it's going down, right? Women who have had, to ch ha had a child, it's like, okay, first child, you know, labor pains are going to come. And then they start coming and then they come and come and come. And then, you know, the baby is birthed. And that is how the last days are described in Matthew chapter 24. And so behold, I am coming quickly also can be rapidly. And so as we look at this, it's just amazing to uh, consider the prophecies in the scripture. Verse 11 goes on, it says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And so you have some opposites, right? Unjust is the opposite of righteous. Filthy is the opposite of holy. And so what is John saying here? He's not saying, if you're a sinner, you have to remain that way and you're stuck. He's saying at this point in time, you've waited too long to get right with God through Jesus Christ, right? Because it's between verse 10, which says the time is at hand, and verse 12, which says I am coming quickly. It, when it comes, it's going to be quick. Don't wait. I remember in junior high, I, uh, I was thinking, I'm just going to have fun now. I'll get right with God later. I was playing a game, and it's not a good game to play. And so here's a warning. Get right with God now. When it starts, you may have waited too late. Don't play this risky game of waiting before making that big change. What did Paul say? Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Verse 12 goes on. It says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. The cool thing about being a Christian and reading this verse, it's like, it could be scary. Because all my works are judged, and I'm rewarded for my works. What is the reward for sinful works? Punishment, right? The thing is, all my sinful works have been wiped out. The only reward I'm getting is for my good works. I like that. <laughs> I like that. I think, you know, if you weighed them out, I think my list of bad works was like way bit bigger than my good works. It says in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those by patient continuance and doing good seek glory and honor and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation, anguish on every soul of man who does evil in, to the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What list do you want to be on? Little motivation this side of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Jesus Christ left. He sent the Holy Spirit. He gave us the goods. He gave us the abilities. He gave us the power, the authority. He, 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 he handed these things to us. And to the one, he gave five talents. To another, two. To another, one. Each according to his own ability. Isn't that amazing? Like, 
God is not going to ask you to be Billy Graham if you don't have the capability of being Billy Graham. He gave to Billy Graham what he gave to Billy Graham. He gave to Rod what he gave to Rod, and he gave to you what he gave to you. What are you going to do with it? This isn't a game where you go, well, that's you. No, it says he gave. I like the term talents. It, it, it meant a sum of money, but, <laughs> but talents, personality, history, intelligence, finances, health, whatever it might be. He gave you things, right? And he gave five talents to another. He gave two to another one, each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on the journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received the one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had five received five talents and came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. And the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And he says it to the same one that invested the two talents. He would have said the same thing to the one with one talent. But what did they do? Nothing. They didn't do anything with it. They didn't invest it. And, 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 it, and it is interesting. I, I want you to consider what God has given you. You know, sometimes people come into the church and they're really struggling. I don't think I'm better than anybody. In fact, when someone comes into the church and they're struggling and I hear their background or they were molested, they went through this and that and the other and they had a struggle and whatever else. And I go, man, I owe it to them to minister to them because I count my talents and I thank God for my blessings all the time, right? I don't think I'm better than other people, but God gave me certain things that I can use to bless other people. I don't have, I didn't ever go through a divorce either in my own life or my parents' life. If you've been through that, it's like, man, I want to encourage you and strengthen you and, and bless you. You know, uh, my parents were loving. They were Christian. I was raised in a Christian home. So how can I judge someone that wasn't? I can't. All I can do is say, God, what, how do you want me to minister to this person? I'm no better, but I count my talents. What are your talents? What are your talents? What has God given you? Well, you, some of you have the experience of being molested and recovering from it, and you handed it over to God, and he gives it back to you with this incredible heart of compassion, understanding, and hope to give it to somebody else, right? Garbage to gold. I don't have that experience. You know, some of you are better at ministering in certain areas than I am. You know, maybe you've been an alcoholic, even though that's a lousy thing to be, but now you're no longer an alcoholic, and now you, you have this treasure in you that you have this experience. You've handed it to God. He's handed it back to you. Now it's a talent. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to sit on it, bury it, or are you going to use it to minister to others that may be struggling in that same place you've struggled with? Everything we have matters, guys. God has invested in you. Don't sell yourself short. The church is not an entertainment center where you come and consume the entertainment. This is a training center. It's a gym. So you come in here, you get built up, you get mended, and then you go out there and you spend your talents and you invest them in people, in this world, in the things that God cares about. And, and, and this is what the church is supposed to be, right? It's not to watch other people invest their talents as you bear your own, <laughs> It's for us to take those talents and invest them. God, what do you have for me? And again, you might be an incredible prayer warrior. Well, praise God. You might have the gift of giving. You might have the gift of mercy. You might be that person that can go down to the homeless ministry and week in and week out deal with these people whose lives are a mess because of drug use. And you might have this incredible patience to love them just as much every single week for years until they come around. That might be you. Praise God. That's your talent. Use it to the fullest of God. And you know what? I can't wait. I can't wait for Jesus to look at me and go, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come in and check out what I've been preparing for you. Check it out. Man, those words, not an impersonal force. You're in heaven now. 
Come on, loudspeakers. He's going to look you in the eye. He knows your name. He even has a nickname for you, right? That you and him share. That's how personally he knows you and he loves you. And he's going to look you in the eye and he's going to say, well done, my good and my faithful servant. Oh, for such a time as this, God has given us peace, patience, a, a sound mind. And, and guys, we are to be the salt and light, especially during this time. You know, I'm not what, what Nancy Pelosi or Clinton or anybody says I am. I'm not what Black Lives Matter says I am. I'm not what Antifa says I am. I'm a child of God. I am what God calls me. No one else can take that. I'm a child of God, and you are too. And we go out into this world without fear. We go out into this world with wisdom and with truth. And God has called us to, to be this. He is the beginning and the end. He is your present. Spend time with Jesus during these times and invest, take an account what he has given to you. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to celebrate in communion. Dear God, we thank you uh, just for the incredible encouragement that your word brings. Lord, you are the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end, and the present God. And may it be that we worship you and worship you alone. May it be that our passion is to bring glory to you, not to ourselves or any other thing. Lord, may we not bow a knee, but may we glorify you. Lord, may we make a personal accounting of of the treasures that you've given each one of us. And whether they may seem a trial, a tragedy, or a triumph, Lord, may we just present them all back to you that you may give them back to us as tools for your kingdom, Lord. May we invest well. And again, for such a time as this, Lord, may we be your salt and your light in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and celebrate in communion this morning.